welcome to the Your Pennsylvania Ancestors podcast. In today's episode, I have a conversation with Northeast Pennsylvania Genealogical Society Sarah Klings, President, and Sandra Penzita, Treasurer. They are fabulous resources if you have any ancestors in Lackawanna or Luzerne counties of Pennsylvania. You will be amazed at the vast collection of genealogical records that they have just waiting for you. Don't miss the memorable stories of discovery that they share at the end of the episode. Have a question or need help to complete your Pennsylvania research? Go to paancestors.com and click leave a question. You'll leave a voicemail for me, a little audio recording of a couple minutes, and I'll be able to use that on a future episode of the podcast. I think that'll be fun. And now here's my conversation with Sarah and Sandra. So um, if you could introduce yourselves, talk about your society and what counties you cover. So when people are listening, they get an idea of who you are. Well, Denise, first, thank you for having us. We very much appreciate this opportunity to speak about our society and uh, introduce ourselves to a larger audience. So thank you very much. Um, about Northeastern Pennsylvania Genealogical Society, otherwise known as N-E-P-G-S. We have been around for 27 years and started just a group of, I'll say, local family researchers that would meet at the public library. And over the course of 27 years, they incorporated, they purchased a small one-room building, quickly outgrew that, uh, moved to a second location, outgrew that, and as of last year, we are in our present uh, facility, which is absolutely beautiful, located um, in Wilkes-Barre, Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. We are two blocks away from our county courthouse, which is convenient, and we are one block away from our county historical society, and largest public library. So in terms of the out of town researcher, we're really convenient. And there's a hotel about three blocks away. So we often get people coming here from out of the area, spending a few nights and they'll hit us up for a few hours, go over to the courthouse, maybe the next day come back, go see some cemeteries. So uh, that's our story. <laughs> but yeah, we, we cover mainly uh, Luzerne and Lackawanna counties. Um, we have a little bit outside of that in our diocese of Scranton, our church records uh, collection, which is our main, it's Roman Catholic church records. Um, that covers some of the, a little bit more surrounding like Wayne and, and Pike counties like that. But our, our main emphasis is Luzerne and Lackawanna counties. That's fantastic. Sandra, you were talking and described the perfect geneal genealogist fantasy trip. You get to do the courthouse, cemeteries, and a genealogical society, all, all within a few blocks of each other. <laughs> yes. I wish my husband would give me that for Christmas. Like, that would be a good one, you know. S send me somewhere I want to go for, and just put me up in a hotel with my computer and a pile of papers. So... In terms of your collection, um, Sarah, you were mentioning the Roman Catholic Church records. I have to imagine those are pretty popular with, with, with the researchers. Yeah, they, they've been a huge boost since we brought them onto our collection. The Diocese of Scranton agreed to let us digitize their records, all 11 counties that were included in that. Um, it's been a huge boost because, I mean, there's a lot of different religions covered in our area, but Roman Catholic is such a huge one here. It's such a huge percentage. Um, so it was a big, you know, for people looking for baptisms and that of their ancestors, it was a huge boost. And it definitely is the one that people look for the most when they come. What are some other records that you have that people can't wait to see when they get there? I think that depends on the researcher. What we really focus on 
is the, I guess I'll call it the private record as opposed to a public record such as a deed or a will or a marriage license application. We focus on the records that you can't get your hands on or you wrote a letter and it's been ignored for a year, even with a donation. So again, it depends on what you're really looking for. Um, if you go to our website, we do have our index available. So you can see, you know, under funeral home records, well, what funeral homes do we have? What years do we have? Um, cemetery records, as Sarah was mentioning, our church records, you can see, was the priest diligent in keeping the record and actually keeping it safe? Uh, it shocks me that these sacramental registers, many times a book or two are missing. And it's like, how do you lose something like that? But yet it happens. In terms of popularity, it absolutely is the Roman Catholic Church records that has been driving people here from all over the United States. I mean, speaking from personal experience, you know, it's, it's a joke, but I want what I want. And I want to see those records. So I'm fortunate all of my ancestors came to this area and stayed in this area. So my ancestral churches, 10 minutes away. So I'm polite. I'll write a letter. I'll be ignored. And then I'll show up at their door with a box of baked goods. So it's kind of hard to turn me down. I think we've all used a little bit of bribery at times in our research. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. What I'm really struck by about what you just shared is your depth of knowledge of the area. Yeah. So I think if you're a researcher who's used to using um, just a computer site, either Ancestry or Family Search or My Heritage or Find My Past, you're just searching sort of these high-level records and censuses and city directories. Mm -hmm. But when this person comes to a, a place like yours, it's like they're getting people with this I, I think they call it like institutional knowledge, but you're making, it's like you are experts in that area. So what are some things that you've shared with people or that come up often that people are surprised by when they, when they, in terms of Lackawanna and Luzerne County? One of the, one of the biggest ones that we found is the fact that there for quite a while, Lackawanna County, like it was Luzerne County covered a big area, covered Scranton. You know, there's a lot of townships and things up there that were in Luzerne County first. And now they're part of Lackawanna County. So they try to distinguish with them, like even when they're looking at the records to say, okay, you have to, it currently is in Lackawanna County, so that's where you actually have to look. Even though your census record says, okay, Luzerne County, right now it's actually not there. Because coming from out of the area, you know, if they, if they only, go, you know, if they were only from, say, California or that, and they've never actually been here, they don't know the boundaries in that. They, they only see on that census it was Luzerne County, and they don't know that it's a completely different area right now. So to try to, to try to bring that to their, you know, d little details like that to their attention is always important. I would say one of the things that surprises most people, which surprises me <laughs> that they might disagree until it's proven that what I'm saying is true, is someone will say, according to the census, my grandparents, my great grandparents, my ancestor, they lived on this street and there was a church three houses away and I have been sitting here for the past two hours and I can't find them in that church. So I will say, well, who are your ancestors? And they will tell me a very obviously Italian name. And I will look and I'd say, well, that's because three houses away, it's a Polish church. And they're like, but why wouldn't they go there? Well, because your ancestors spoke Italian and I guarantee they went three miles away and went to that church. And they'll say, but that church they could walk to, it's, it's so close. And I say, but they want to worship in their own language. They want to meet with their community. So then they'll go and they'll look in those records and surprise, 
I was right. <laughs> and and that, I, I just, it, again, it surprises me that people are not thinking in terms of ethnicity and the desire to be with people who speak your language, especially mm -hmm. um, a church, especially your, your priest, your pastor. So yeah, and there was there was some churches even in the area that were split off where say like some Polish people went to a German church for a while and it split off because the, the pastor said, you know, we're not serving them well here with the language barrier and all of that. So so there's you know, there's churches that sprung out and knowing the with us having done the research in that for a while, we know the ins and outs of the history of some of them. So tell them, you know, which church to go to when it's split off like that. Excellent. What you just shared, I was just thinking about this morning, is how, as researchers, we're not looking at people in terms of community. We look at them in terms of being an individual. And really, they're a part of a family. They're a part of a neighborhood. They're a part of their ethnic group. Or they're a part of their religious group. And we need to look at all those things when we're researching them. We can't just think of them as, you know, John Smith, born in 1932, and da 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 we really have to think about them as, as full human beings living in communities. Well, there were no social services. You know, if your husband is killed in the mines and you have seven children under the age of 10, you cannot go to your county welfare society. You know, you relied upon your neighbors and you lived in an ethnic neighborhood and you relied on your church. That's who took care of you. Would they walk several miles to fellowship with their their community? Absolutely, and that surprises people. Yeah, I mean, it's like even the distances that people will travel, people don't realize that people walk some pretty far places then mm -hmm. to get where they wanted to go. Like yeah. they really didn't think about the distance; they just went. That is surprising. So it wasn't uncommon for people to walk a couple miles to church to be with their. No, 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 not at all. I mean, and what, what surprises me is you're looking at these baptism records and you're seeing the day the baby's born and the day the baby's baptized. And you know that mother who has just given birth has a house full of young children, but yet she got up, she got dressed, she got that baby to church to be baptized within three days yeah. or within a week yeah, it was a very short time period and you're thinking oh my goodness how did you get everybody to church yeah yeah <laughs> it is it's really yeah when you when you think about the logistics of it it really is it really yeah. is shocking <laughs> so what other kinds of things you mentioned the church records and the funeral home records what other kinds of records do you have that that would be special you know and people would be delighted to see when they come to visit we have cemetery records um, we have some we were gifted um, some original newspapers that were very old that they had not been microfilmed which we thought was very shocking so we digitized those um, they're from the hazelton area so we are the only source to find this i'll call it a gap in a newspaper collection that is online, you know, with newspapers.com, that we have a few of those missing years. Especially more recently, we've been growing, we have a lot of high school yearbooks, mm -hmm. uh, and we've been, or as a matter of fact, our collection has increased more and more, especially in the last few weeks of the high school yearbooks. Some, you know, some pretty old, it's like the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, so people that don't have a picture already of their relatives, they could actually go into those yearbooks and see a picture of them. Mm -hmm. oh, that's great. That's fantastic. What about, do you collect uh, genealogies that people have completed on families in the area? Yes. If you um, have completed a genealogy and you would like us to have a copy of it, we will digitize it and give the uh, copy back to you. One of the things that we really focus on is being digital. You know, paper is on its way out and people are computer savvy. And they kind of, they're, they're used to that 
sitting in their pajamas at three o'clock in the morning doing their genealogy. So <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> The things that you've digitized, are those available to people at home through your through a membership or just on site or both? Um, unfortunately, we have uh, nothing in place that uh, to put the records online. And it's for several reasons. And the biggest stumbling block is uh, getting back to the type of records, the bulk of our collection. Again, it's records that were created to be private. Mm. So if it's a church record, you might find, or you will likely find, illegitimacies. If it's cemetery records, you might find references to suicides. These things were not put in the record with the intention that someone, the general public, is going to be seeing this. So when we approach the record holder, so if it's, say it's a church, that's their first concern is confidentiality. And what we negotiate is if you allow us to make a digital copy and have it at our facility for the public to come in, there's a 70 year privacy rule. So you are not going to see a record unless it's at least 70 years old. Further, you cannot get as a patron a full page of a record. So you can only get your ancestor's record. We will you know, extract that information and put it with the header. And that has made our record holder comfortable. So if we were to say, hey, we're gonna put these on the internet, they wouldn't have a conversation with us. A second part of that is, which I don't think I mentioned, is we are 100% volunteers. There is no one paid here. We are just a group of passionate genealogists getting together every week to have fun. <laughs> and we invite the public to come join us. <laughs> and uh, we're a small group, small but mighty. And we all have to wear many hats, different hats. Uh, Sarah is our webmaster. Uh, which she has taken on that responsibility. And to be quite honest, we just are not sophisticated enough to be able to do something <laughs> like that. We, we, we're, we're just really great at what we do. And, uh, and that is convincing record holders to allow us to make copies and share it with the public. And unfortunately, you have to either come here or you have to have one of our genealogists uh, fill a research request for you. So, you know, we have no plans to digitize. Well, I mean, you, you've digitized, but making it accessible for making it accessible. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, I mean, they, yeah. Can see it, but only at our site. Yeah. 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 I think that's completely reasonable. My own genealogical society is digitizing their church records and these were collected before the internet so there's not that privacy concern you know and these aren't because i'm in berks county catholic faith wasn't as large here it was um uh, mostly protestant so there's not the level of detail that sometimes in a catholic <laughs> a catholic sacramental register i've seen some pretty interesting things in my own family on those uh, lots of extraneous notes, and I'm like, what did the priest write in Latin? <laughs> I need to like figure this out. Uh, what are these extra comments on my ancestor? But part of the digitization effort is to one have a backup, so in case something horrific happens, you know, to the building, um, the records are going to be fine. Um, and we've have had records stolen where people have walked out with a completely bound book. Um, either intentionally or unintentionally, right? You never know um, the intent of the person, if they just stuck them in their bag by accident or if they wanted to take that entire bound volume from 17, whatever. But it's more or less for the volunteers to make their job easier too for when research requests come in. They can easily print that page out or you know several pages and stuff. Digitizing is a funny thing, I think, because if you take away those records from societies or make them completely available on the internet how does this how does the society stay alive in terms of revenue and volunteers you know like i 
I don't know. Um, since you brought that up, we <laughs> Um, a fairly large uh, public cemetery in our area, and we were um, digitizing their records and their plot cards and, you know, their full collection, maps. It was wonderful. And this is before we had a policy of not giving out complete collections. And someone came in and they obtained, with our permission, copies of all of the cemetery's records, and then they put them on find a grave. <gasps> we have yet to have another person come in and look at those records that we spent how many, you know, 20, 30 hours digitizing them. The expense, again, we're all volunteers, so not only are we passionate about genealogy, but we also have to be fundraisers. And yeah, so we, we learned the hard way that mm. you can only get your family because once it leaves our facility, we've lost control. So. And, and yeah. there's, there's a place for societies too because, okay, if everything's online, everybody has all that information, but at the same time, they lose that personal, you know, the extra knowledge that we've, you know, being here and everything that we've gained, it's, it's a, you know, it'd be a big loss to just have everything just put online and just have it, if they lose that extra little bit of knowledge that goes with it. Yeah, I, I think so. I, you lose the connection to the area. Well, it's like back to that community thing again that we talked about. Like, you know, the new community now is the one we create for ourselves and the one we find, I think, you know, and we do that through genealogy. And if you go to a local historical or genealogical society, you're, you're finding a new community in a sense through your ancestors. I, I walked in, I've walked into ones and had, and surprisingly found out I was like third cousin once removed from, you know, the, the gentleman helping me. We figured that out. Let me think what else I want to ask you. The memberships that you have. So when people ask for, if they're from far away and they can't travel there um, through their ideal genealogical road trip, what can you offer to a researcher that can't get there? We have a, a great uh, research staff here. There's a couple of us that, that go, like they research, you know, the requests come in. Um, they just had to give us background information, you know, like they, you know, general dates that they're looking for, if it's, you know, a particular marriage record and that kind of thing. Um, it, they could just send it into us and, and let us know, give it us an idea of the church that they're looking at. It definitely helps to go onto our website at uh, nepgs.com and take a look at our index first before they put in a request that way they see exactly what we have. Um, just to get an idea of churches to narrow it down because it makes our job a little easier. Um, but we, this way we're able, they're able to get the information and not have to, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a um, indirect way to get, to get the information. It's not like online, but it's, you could get it from home just by putting in that request. And what if somebody had a more general request, like I'm looking for the parents of Isaac Kowalski, you know, born in 1872. They don't have anything other than that. Yeah, and that's that we've had that happen, something similar to that. We've had that happen multiple times. Um, and just really, we just had to use basically our knowledge. If they at least have like a town name in that and an ethnicity, we have to use our own knowledge then to try to narrow down. And, you know, especially if they don't have a church name in that, um, our, our, you know, our knowledge base definitely helps us to get those, you know, more generic requests fulfilled. Okay. You just okay. said that, and I was thinking, okay, Mr. Kowalski for, what was it, 1872, I'm thinking mm -hmm. he probably went to the first Polish church in the area, which would have been in Nanticoke, so uh, yes, we, we can handle obscure. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a great example of the, the knowledge that you have. You can immediately think in your brains already are, this is the church he would have went to. And you can get people set on the right direction rather than floundering around, you know, trying to figure out where to go next. You know, it, it surprises me. People will come in and, you know, they'll spend the day and, you know, you hear them sighing. <laughs> So of course it's what's going on and they'll say, Oh, you know, I can't find this or I can't find that. And I'll sit, you know, if the computer next to them is free, I'll sit down and tick, 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 tick. I'm like, is that what you're looking for? <laughs> and 
like, how did you find that so quickly? And again, you know, I, I don't mean to sound conceited, but I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so if you come in, you're going to find, you know, just a, a group of people who are passionate about genealogy, who are just as excited as, as you are about your family. And we really want you to have the very best experience here. You know, if you have a brick wall, bring it on. You know, it, it's funny. We'll have people, they come in and we're a library. So it tends to be quiet. And you'll hear every now and then these little noises, you know, um, these exclamations or sighs or whatever. And of course, it's like, did you see a mouse? What's, what's happening? And they'll tell you, I've been looking for 10 years and I just found that. And, it, and it's just, you know, we get excited with them. So it, it really pays to come see us because if, if I don't know the answer, there's a handful of other knowledgeable staff members who maybe, you know, I refuse to do Irish genealogy. I refuse it. Sarah has a certification in it. So <laughs> if someone comes in, you know, and they're looking for Cornelius McDonald, my eyes glaze over and here's Sarah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we complement each other's knowledge base. Not everybody knows everything, but yeah, between yeah. us, between us, we have you know, decent amount that we could provide for everybody. But even, even these research requests that come in, you know, you're paying for an hour of our time and you're going to get that hour. If you look at that request and again, it seems obscure and, you know, you followed your first instinct, you know, we'll show it, you know, around to, to each other and be like, well, what do you think? Where else can I go? What, what can I do? You know, so you're just, you're not getting one person you're getting the whole staff. We really want you to, to find your records. We want you to leave here saying, I had the best day ever, you know? And uh, so that's what we strive for. That's so wonderful. And I, I love how you offer that second set of eyes and that expert opinion, you know, and viewpoint. Uh, for anyone that walks in the door, you can say, oh, did you, did you look at it like this? And they're like, oh, you know, and all of a sudden brick wall tumbling down because I think we all get a little myopic, a little, you know, crazed in our research and, and only look at it one way. Well, this has to be it. This has to be it. And we, built, and we kind of build our own brick wall in the process um, and somebody else can look at it from a different direction and say, oh, you know, how about this? How about if you try this spelling of the name or Robert went by this other name you know, around here that was a popular nickname or something, you know, there's other just things like that. Right. Or, or you know, someone, we had a, a gentleman come in from San Antonio, Texas, and he was planning a trip to Ireland. And he said, it's critical that I find my ancestral village. and again, ugh, that Irish genealogy. So we're looking in his direct line and there is just no information other than he's from Ireland, which we knew that. So again, you know, this man is like, I have the trip planned. And it's like, well, let's see who else he was surrounded by. The next door neighbor or, or, you know, somebody held a funeral from your ancestor's house. Why would they have done that? Then looking at that other person had an obituary and had the county that they were from. So then that narrowed things down. And then going into those Irish records, oh, we found him. So, um, <laughs> you know, again, you know, taking those blinders off that sometimes you just need somebody, you know, who is not so deep and, and so focused and so in the weeds as you are, who can just say, well, what about trying that? And lo and behold, there you go. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's so great. And I bet he had the best trip. He did. Yeah, he sent me pictures. <laughs> <laughs> that's great forming that community again around genealogy. So what haven't I asked you about 
um, N E P G S. <laughs> I should get all my letters right. Our, our most correct. memorable discovery. Yeah, what's something memorable that? Well, it's not so much that we found a really incredible record or, you know, something really unusual in that record. Um, I received a request from a woman who, uh, she said they had just placed her grandmother in hospice and that she would be dead in a few days. And her family had asked her to write the grandmother's obituary. But when she started talking to her family members, they realized they didn't know all the siblings' names. They knew that they, you know, she was one of nine, but yet they had some family members who left the area and, you know, they weren't talked about. So she asked for my help and I, I was thinking, well, this is an easy request. You know, census records are going to have your siblings' names. Um, her grandmother's marriage license application is going to verify, you know, her mother's maiden name. It will give her occupation, her place of work before she was a homemaker. Um, a yearbook would confirm, you know, was she a high school graduate? So I, I was very, you know, quickly able to fulfill the request. And I emailed her the information. And within a few minutes, I heard back and, and she wrote that she was in tears and that I had given her family such a gift. And she went on to write that apparently at some point her grandmother had suffered a, a debilitating illness and it had changed her appearance. And she was so devastated about the physical changes in her appearance that she destroyed every photograph that she had of herself. And what did I send her? Her high school yearbook photograph. So, so to see Graham as a young person, she was just filled with joy. And again, you think eh, yearbooks, census records, you know, they're not exciting. But yet to that particular individual, it made a huge impact. Um, and then there was another time, uh, more recently, again, getting back to being part of the genealogy community, uh, a woman came in with her older sons. I would say she was probably in her seventies and immediately her sons sit down at the computers and they, they just really start digging into our records. And of course, this 70 some year old woman apparently was not very computer savvy and, and she was very hesitant to do much of anything. So again, I want everybody who comes here to have a positive experience. And I sat down with her and I said, what is it you want to find? And she said, I just want to find my parents' marriage records. Well, that's easy. So we found the church record and, you know, she was looking at it and she's like, oh, you know, the witnesses, she was talking about them and oh, the priest, you know, and taking it a step further. I'm like, well, let's look at the marriage license application. Again, easy record, find it on family search. And the record popped up on, you know, the computer screen and she just leaned in and started weeping. Aww. And then she said, you know, she said, look, it's my parents' signatures. And she touched the screen of the computer. And, you know, it was just such a simple thing, but yet, wow. Um, you know, and, and it's just a reminder that with these everyday records that really don't have these extreme values, that it, they mean so much to that person who's looking for them. And uh, it, it just really, you know, if you talk about something that's memorable, mm. this woman weeping at her, her parent's signature, but then, you know, memorable uh, we had another woman come in and she said, hey, I planned a trip to Lithuania. I'm going to Lithuania. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, but of course, question, I want to find my ancestral village. Don't we all? <laughs> um, but the good thing, and again, you know, when, when we're slow, 
I just sit down and start reading the records just to see what's there. And one of the things that I have noticed over and over again is our ethnic churches. And by ethnic, I mean a church where the priest did not speak in English. And often, not always, the priest recorded the village name, in, incorporated it into the record. So I said, well, let's look at a baptism record. And the priest, he wrote both the parents' names, and he not only wrote the baby's names, but also the grandparents' names, the mother's maiden name, the village that they were from in Lithuania, and he gets a gold star, the parish that they worshipped in in Lithuania. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we hit the jackpot. The unfortunate thing was she was so new to genealogy, she had no clue how significant <laughs> this record was. <laughs> that we are all pea green with envy <laughs> that she has this huge paragraph, you know, it had everything except for, you know, their shoe sizes. And she's just like, okay, all right, writing it down. And I'm like, oh. It's like walking into a casino and straight and doing a jackpot and going, what's so hard about this? Right in the first try. Right in the first try. Yeah. Right. But no, it, it does. It, it really warms our heart to be able to, to help people find like little details like that, you know, especially since they want that connection to their ancestors. You know, some of them come in for, you know, dual citizenship purposes and, and things like that. And and to be, you know, it, it does, it warms our heart. It's, you know, it's, it really is, it's personal for us too, because we, we do want them to find that information. Beautiful. And we want them to tell all of their friends. <laughs> we do. We want them to tell them what a good experience they had so mm -hmm. that they could then come in and have the same good experience. It's, yeah, absolutely. So um, anything else that you would like to share about your society for people? Um, just to um, just to check out our website again, nepgs.com. It'll give them a really really full idea. Or uh, there's an index. I mean, they can't view the records on there, but they could at least see exactly what they have. They could go into each tab and say, okay, this is the yearbooks we have. This is the you know funeral home records. It'll give them a good a good gauge for even when they come in and plan a trip to us. It'll give them you know it'll it'll budget their time better if they have an idea of exactly what they want to look at when they come. We are always on the lookout for records. And we have one um, volunteer that that's what he does is he knocks on the doors and he sends the emails and he calls over and over again. Um, so if anybody knows of any you know, record holders, they are willing to you know, share them with us. We have a whole staff of volunteers that that's all they do, our digitizing guys. And uh, we like to keep them busy. And we just received a grant for a book scanner. So they're planning on taking it on the road to the Anthracite Heritage Museum that there are some coal mining records when coal miners receive their mining certificate. That's something new that's going to be coming to our collection um, in the upcoming weeks, depending on how quickly they work. But yeah, we, uh, we're always adding things, so it's, it's always good to keep checking back with us, too. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah, people think of genealogy as being static, and, you know, well, don't we have all the records from the 18-whatever year? Like, no, like, because there's business records, and, you know, always, like, churches broke off from each other, you know, like, they form new congregations, and... Um, sometimes there's pastor's records or family Bibles that show up or funeral homes that close or, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there's always something that shows up. Yeah. Speaking of churches that broke off, we are um, in the process, or I think we're getting close to wrapping up the Polish National Catholic Church, which is an offshoot. We'll have that collection coming up. Yeah, wow. it's, it's always exciting to be able to add more and more because like you said, there's always something new. There's never, there's never just a stop point. There's always something to find. And in terms of um, our digitizing, we do it for free. Um, the only thing that we ask is that you purchase, and by you, the record holder, the device that we put the records on. So if it's a hard drive, we ask that you reimburse us the cost of the hard drive. But 
otherwise, you know, like when we did the Scranton Diocese, that's 11 counties, over 300 churches. We had one volunteer that drove around. He'd pick up the records, bring them back to our facility. They'd get digitized and he'd drive them back along with the hard drive. And again, we asked for nothing other than reimburse us that, you know, cost so we don't have any, you know, out-of-pocket expenses. So it's a great deal. Wow. That's fantastic. I mean, for a church too, it's a backup of their records, you know, that they have another set of, of, of those offsite in case anything happened. Well, that's, and, and when you see the condition that some of them were in when they were digitized, it's nice to have that while they're still okay, you know, to have that backup, especially because it's, they're not going to get any younger, the records, <laughs> this is not gonna take, you know, so to speak, but this way they at least have that backup just in case, you know, because you can say, you never know, you know, that natural disaster, but the, you know, it's there in the digitized area. Yeah. Uh, but what, one of the things that, you know, we try to sell is you don't ever have to handle these books again. You can put them in your fireproof safe. Your secretary can just sit there at her computer and click, 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 and pull up. Our records are so high quality. You really look like you can just reach through the screen and turn the page. So that's a huge selling point because, you know, as Sarah alluded to, these records, you know, some of them, the, the pages are, you know, they're chipping. And as you turn them, little bits are falling to the floor. Mm -hmm. And to know you don't have to have it rebound. You can just put it away somewhere safe and it never has to be handled again. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, and just to emphasize, so this is a service that your society provides to people that have ge records of genealogical interest you go in, you pick them up, scan them, put them on a hard drive, give the, that place a copy of the records and you have a copy of the records. Correct, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's wonderful. We're always looking for volunteers. It helps, we, we love being able to volunteer, but to have even more people, it's, it's you know, it makes it, it makes it easier. It makes, gives more knowledge base because the more people you bring in, the more knowledge base. And it, you know, it helps us out. We could, you, we could help more patrons that way. Okay, so I think it's important for people to realize too, if you are new to research, you know, in genealogy and to definitely join your local genealogical society, even if you don't have relatives or ancestors in that area, because you're going to learn the method of researching, you know, um, I learned a ton in my, I, I don't have any ancestors in the county that I live in right now. Um, but I have learned so much about how to research church records, tax records, census records. Read Latin. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Read Latin. Um, uh, prothonotary records, what the prothonotary does. Read old deeds, you know, and I can take that knowledge and go to a, another county in Pennsylvania and, and definitely use it. I mean, it's not wasted time um and and the methods get that something out of the membership to there even like you said even if it's on a personal level it's on that you know that professional so to speak yeah. knowledge and you yeah. also you never know what you're going to find that you know you may say with confidence oh i found every record and my people aren't you know they're only there for two years you never know what you're going to find in a record that maybe it doesn't really refer to your family, but it's a similar situation. And you'll be thinking, hey, they went here after there. Maybe my family did too. You never know what you're going to pick up. I, I think that is a great place to end it. You never know what you're going to find and you never know what you're going to pick up <laughs> when you go and you do research. That's perfect. Well, um, Sarah and, and Sandra, thank you so much for your time this afternoon for telling us about not only the Northeast uh, Pennsylvania Genealogical Society, but your experience there and what people can find there. And I think, I mean, it's a no brainer to me. If I had ancestors in Lackawanna, I'd be beating down your door to get there for sure. <laughs> for Absolutely. sure. <laughs> yeah. Denise, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. I want
want to thank Sarah and Sandra again for sharing all their experiences and all NEPGS has to offer. The Northeast Pennsylvania Genealogical Society is one of those resources that you don't want to miss as a genealogist to really get the most out of your research. I'd really appreciate it if you'd left a review of the podcast, especially on Apple, because so many people access their podcast through Apple. You can also leave me a comment uh, through my website, paancestors.com, or on Twitter or Instagram. Check it out in the show notes. 